Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to all of you who stayed here for the last lecture. It's a privilege, right, both for the audience and the speaker. I'm going to talk about something that everybody seems to be very, very familiar with. Uh, actually, I think there are two things that people can talk about automatically. One is uh, soccer, right? Everybody understands soccer. Uh, and, uh, well, maybe politics as well, but the other one is language, right? Language, uh, language use. Uh, I would like to, first of all, I would like to call your attention to a slight change in the title. It's not the change in the topic, but uh, media has been changed to medium. The medium here means uh, a vehicle. Medium, in my present talk, uh, is supposed to mean the verbal fabric of thoughts narratives or discourse. In that sense, it's the medium, and not the media as printed media or televised media. So I would like to talk about the lure of the medium in creating social discourse. That means the lure of the verbal environment that we have at our disposal. And I also would like to talk about discourse as social cognition. Cognition is a new term for an old phenomenon, trying to understand the world and adaptively contribute to the survival of humankind. Understanding the world involves understanding both inner and outer worlds. Cognition is a learning process through experience and education. Cognition involves perception, observation, conception, and conceptualization. Conceptualization, in my mind, and for the present purposes, could be put into two categories, individual conceptualization, for example, the stored, the, these individual conceptualizations are stored in the mental lexicon of each speaker, and also we, have, we can talk about collective conceptualization uh, that is stored in cultural parameters, norms, and cultural narratives. The thesis of my talk is fairly straightforward. There is a growing tension, I feel, between possessing language as an abstract system of signs, as a, biologically and, as a biological endowment in the form of a mental organ, the workings of which is provided for us for, for the use of each individual member of the speech community. And as opposed to that, the use of language, which is verbal interaction in the form of discourse and narrative as a social practice based on intentionality, intended understanding, and communicative consensus. I am claiming that the causes for the obvious changes in our attitudes to a verbal medium are to be sought in changing nature of social reality. More precisely, there are changing frames of reference for interper interpersonal meaning creation, which have epistemic and ontological explanations in the status of context as a benchmark in mental creation. Let us take a brief look at what we can do with language, for example, with the help of language, and what we can do to language, that is, to twist language, to exploit language, to manipulate language, and so forth, and so on. I am claiming here that 20th century was obsessed by looking at human language as a potential instrument to encode information. Since the cognitive turn, we have been looking at language as the manifestation of the way we think as a result of complex mental processes used for cognition with general purpose cognitive skills and special purpose cognitive skills, language being one of the special purpose faculties. 20th century was conceived in Sin. Sin, of course, it was Gottlob Frege, well, it was 19th century, 1882, Über Sinn und Bedeutung. His article, Frege was a mathematician, his, his, his article, uh, tackle the question of denotation, what and how linguistic expressions denote. 
And then, of course, he came up with a dichotomy of Sinn und Bedeutung, sense and reference. This is what we use in English ever since, or intentions and extensions. Bertrand Russell, on denoting 1905, uh, 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 followed followed this train of tradition and this train of thoughts, figuring out, okay, how linguistic expressions can can denote different things. Uh, And here, don't misunderstand, I put up some names here, not not for name dropping, of course, but we, we, we have experienced right this line of uh, of developments of, of of these ideas concerning language Wittgenstein Husserl Carnap Strawson Austin Montague Kripke Davidson Dennett Grice Searle okay just to name some of the people uh, who have been greatly uh, who were keen on on saying something about language Of course, among them, we have uh, analytical uh, philosophers, we have ordinary language philosophers, we have phenomenology, of course, and also Gestalt psychology, people who who, uh, elaborated on Gestalt psychology. I think I would would mention here uh, paradigm shifts. And I think, for, for the purpose of my argument, I would like to identify three paradigms uh, that can be distinguished. A, uh, there was a paradigm, or there is a paradigm in which we explore the boundaries of language as an instrument, right? The language fabric, the grammar, okay? The, 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 the system of signs uh, that we manipulate, compute. Then there is a, another paradigm concerning language, of course, which explores the conditions under which linguistic expressions uttered in verbal interaction will obtain their intended meanings. So that's not only about encoded information in language, but also already speaker intentions. And here, of course, we have the well-known distinction between sentence meaning, propositional meaning, utterance meaning, and also speaker meaning. Ordinary language philosophy, British philosophy, uh, in the second half of the, ninth, uh, of the 20th century, right, is pretty much about utterances, what we can do with words, for example, Austin's. And the third paradigm I would like to mention is the one that explores the changing epistemic and ontological status of contexts and the parameters of context creation with the help of linguistic expressions as prompts for constructed meanings. Here, we get away from, from an encoded information in language, but we take language only as a, as a, as a possibility for, for meaning creation, something that prompts, uh, of course, under given or created circumstances, some interpretation. Sperber and Wilson, in their book, 1986 relevance book, say contexts are mental. Of course, they mean that we talk about situations. Situations are represented, of course, in the mental, uh, as, as mental pictures, but contexts are mental in a sense that we have to create contexts in order to arrive at any interpretation that language may carry or, 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 or transmit. What do we do with the help of language? We have mental processes in syntactic parsing and utterance interpretation, both in parsing syntactically the the linguistic fabric or utterance interpretation. For example, when I say everyone in this room speaks two languages, I think we understand automatically, we process the the sentence, right? And we also process the utterance. That means, uh, you know, the the kind of of, uh, intended meaning if there is any uh, behind it. It's the, the language is, uh, sorry, sorry, this sentence is ambiguous, okay, but I would like to claim that it's a non trivial ambiguity that is behind it. Uh, basically, with a little bit of logical background, we, we usually say that everyone in this room speaks two languages, contains two quantifications one is everyone, and the other one is two languages. So the question is whether we have 
an existential quantification that, is, that has a wider scope, that is stronger than the universal quantification, then we have the, 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 uh, the, the meaning okay, that there are two languages such that these two languages are spoken by everyone in this room. Okay? So existential quantification is at the beginning, okay? And everyone in this room speaks two languages. It means for everyone, there are two languages in this room. If you pick any person in this room, you can find two languages that the, that, that, that person speaks. Now, the existential and the universal quantification here, which one has a wider scope, right? Which one is a stronger quantification over the other, makes a big difference. But even so, right, this is, this is how we, we, okay, I think everybody would agree here that this sentence, right, could have a meaning that two specific languages are spoken by everybody or for everybody we can find two languages that they speak. However, of course, we <laughs> seem to be rational agents, okay, and we do allow in this, I would say now in this context, right, the context that is created by this proposition, we would allow that some people speak more than two languages. Hmm? Everybody in this room speaks two languages. So there should be a meaning that everybody, for every person, we can find two and only two languages that these people speak. Or we could say, for everyone, we, we can find two languages uh, that, that these people speak, at least, sorry, at least two languages that these people speak. Some people may speak three or four languages. Okay, and the third, option is where the, where the existential quantification is strongest, then we say specifically there are two languages that are spoken by everyone in this room, Slovenian and English, okay? So these languages will be spoken by, by everyone, so everyone in this room speaks two languages. Okay, why did I bring it here? I brought this example here because I wanted to say that even if we follow fairly well-established logical uh, uh, parameters and, and quantification, for example. Even so, there are some extra pieces of information. There, there are possibilities that go beyond the determination, I mean, the linguistically determined meaning, namely, as I said, at least two languages or or only two languages, or specifically two languages. So this sentence is manifold ambiguous, but we don't feel like that when we process uh, the, 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 the linguistic expressions. What do we do with the help of languages further? Possible worlds, counterfactual worlds are so often, they figure so often in our context building, right, in our, in our uh, okay. If I had known that my grandchildren would be so much fun, I would have had them first. Well, everybody is happy and funny. Okay, this is funny. But the, the interesting thing is that we do create, we do activate alternative possible worlds here, right? Okay, one word is that, that, uh, that, you, that you have your grandchildren, hmm, they could be identified as your grandchildren. I won't go into that, that's deictic, right? My grandchildren are not your grandchildren or somebody else's, so actually we could identify these, these individuals I'm referring to. So my grandchildren, hmm, as they are, they should, should be my children. Hmm? That would be different. That's one, one possible world. So here, what we, what we do with these possible worlds, we shift these worlds, right? Parallel, we, we process these worlds par parallelly, and then, of course, we actually select some of the properties, okay, of these possible worlds, and we make a blend. We make a blend. Everybody was smiling or laughing because this sounds very good, and we, okay, everybody understood well that, of course, and this is, this is yet a third possible world, or a, a, sorry, a third in, interpreted world that, of course, if your grandchildren were your children, they were just as nasty, <clears throat> sorry, just as <laughs> difficult, right, uh, as your children were when they were your children. Okay, so of course we know that. It, it, it's, not, it's not a solution to make your grandchildren your children because then, then the 
you know, the whole hierarchy within the family, right, would be, would be re-established as it was originally. Um, if I were dead, I would be the last to know. I think it's attributed to Mark Twain. Again, again, it's, it's interesting because we do allow ourselves imagination, right? A possible world. We do allow ourselves to say that I am dead, it's a piece of news, but I will be the last to know because everybody else will know earlier than I do. Or, of course, uh, you know, the, the other possibility that I will never know that because at least, at least this is what we, what we assume. So here, again, we have blended mental spaces and also just temporary interpretations of worlds and we don't take these, okay, let me call them contexts, right? Uh, we, we don't take these contexts as fixed meanings, but they, they, are, they are candidates hmm, for interpretation. They are, they are meaning, alternative meanings. Okay, we talked about metaphors today. Very, I, I was very happy that, that, that certainly uh, we, we, we do have metaphors, uh, dead metaphors. We do have new metaphors. Uh, we, we, we have metaphors in everyday life. I mean, it's very, very simple, very easy in everyday language usage to, to use figurative language. Life is a bumpy road. Okay, love is a journey. All these things. Uh, people like Lakoff, uh, Turner, Kovacic, other people claim that we have conceptual metaphors, underlying conceptual metaphors, so we can understand any if you like, new metaphors based on, on underlying conceptual metaphors because it's, it's like a support for deriving the interpretation of these metaphors. But also, I would like to call attention to reflectivity. What does it mean that we reflect on certain things with the help of language? Of course, we, we use language to, to say that we have done some reflections. Philosophy provides reflections on human knowledge but everyday practice provides relevant responses to changing contexts. I'm not saying that, of course, in everyday practice, we do not, we do not conceptualize uh, the, 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 the fact of reflexivity, but we do respond to, to changing contexts. So there is a very strong ability uh, in our everyday practices just to respond to different, different conditions and different, different contexts. Therefore, human beings are sensitive to contexts. Culture, for example, is a major, provides for a major context. Well, of course, diverse aspects of, 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 uh, of, of contexts, or an array of contexts. Conventional conceptual structures are inherited, right? We talk about culture as handed down Okay, from one generation to another, from one person to another. Culture is also restrictive, restrictive to a great sense, and of course we talk about socialization. Socialization is a restrictive uh, joint act in the, in, the, in the community. In education we talk about formal education and informal education. In socialization, we talk about primary, primary socialization, which is usually the, 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 the family, right, in which people are, are reared and, and brought up. And then secondary socialization. In life, a lot of different types of possibilities for, for socialization. Natural language, as I mentioned before, uh, is a formal system of signs with a lexicon and rules of construction. Uh, a linguistic context uh, will have language-specific features. So if it's Basque, if it's Finnish, if it's uh, uh, Slo Slovenian, right? It's language-specific as far as rules are concerned, morphosyntactic rules, phonological rules, uh, but also the lexicon, right? The vocabulary that we acquire, of course, are specific for each language. So we, we, we have sensitivity to say that certain expressions belong to a linguistic system. However, the lexicon is, is, is a wonderful terrain for understanding mental images, cognitive models, because the lexicon is not on the other hand, it's not just part of the language, but it opens up 
windows to encyclopedic knowledge, world knowledge, different types of knowledge. <clears throat> the question should be raised, are linguistically transmitted meanings fixed meanings or fixed and predetermined meanings as encoded in language or are they prompts for further elaboration by context building guided by relevance? And then I thought about this, uh, this um, quotation by, by Einstein, who said, and it's my paraphrase, I, I didn't find the original, uh, original quotation, we cannot hope to solve the problems we ourselves identify and formulate in the same mindset in which those problems were conceived. So we realized that there are problems, we formulated the problems, but for finding a solution to, to the problems, it's very likely that we need to step out of a mindset and, and look at it from another perspective. Uh, M.C. Escher came to my mind, and then we can see that, of course, uh, hands, right? One hand drawing, another hand that comes to life and draws the hand that draws the, 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 the previous hand. Okay, again, right, uh, it's a paradox, right? We see that in real life it's not, it's not all right. However, also we know that these are possible worlds, contexts are created in which, from another perspective, right, we could say that, that uh, an active hand draws a hand which then comes to life and then has, it, has its life and acts accordingly. So I think the, the meta levels, when we think about meta levels, right, uh, the second one by M.C. Escher is, is in a drawing, right, in a visual um, articulation, but then we can also have a propositional one which, one, which was mentioned by Einstein. Uh, again, one example, very briefly, I would like to show you that the, the orchestra filled the concert hall with sunshine. The orchestra filled the concert hall with sunshine. I think the first thing would be, uh, m many people actually propose this, there would be a, a literal fallacy, right? Literal fallacy, that means certain things could, be, could have a literal meaning, and of course, uh, of course uh, the orchestra has nothing to do with the sunshine, okay? And if it's literal, right, then the orchestra fills the concert hall, it means uh, actually, there are so many people, musicians, they fill the concert hall and there's no room for other people, for example, the audience. But of course it's not that, right? So we, we realize uh, right away that it's, it's non-literal, it should be figurative. Um, of course, we have an automatic or unconscious processing and um, we could ask, is is, is, is it important what the different linguistic expressions denote, what kind of denotations there are? Yes, I think. Here, the interesting thing is that the, the orchestra is used here as a metonymy, right? As we say, for example, uh, White House is, is angry over some events, right? Then, of course, it's not White House, but it's the U.S. government. Then we say the orchestra did something. The, the orchestra filled the concert hall. It's the music played by the orchestra, metonymy, and sunshine is a metaphor. So the whole thing comes together very quickly. Okay, we process not the linguistic information, and this is my claim here, not the, what the words carry, but we have to make the steps okay, towards uh, context building, and in that context, or in those contexts, we understand that sunshine is, has properties of nice music, right? And then th that music is caused by some people, the musicians, the orchestra, and so on and so forth. Many, many things like that. I like Indians without reservations. Okay, ambiguous uh, question, ambiguous sentence. Again, we have to, of course, support the different interpretations by appropriate contexts that we build around the interpretations. And allegedly Margaret Thatcher was saying as, when she was a banker, I treat other people's money as if it were my own. Okay, how you treat your own money, how you treat other people's money. Again, conceptual, 
conceptually based uh, uh, contexts have to be created to support uh, the different interpretations. Um, okay, I just very briefly would like to mention that it is, it is well justified to suppose that we have different types of meanings. Now today, of course, we have seen that we talk about different senses, right? Different senses that, 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 that are inevitable for, for our evaluations and interpretations. Here, I, I mention knowledge, different types of knowledge that need to be activated when the linguistic prompts are there so that we can, <clears throat> we can create the interpretations and the context. Knowledge of language, language specific. Lexical knowledge, as I mentioned, it has already knowledge about the world. The lexicon is a mental lexicon. Uh, it's not a list of items, but it's, it's, it's about the world. Encyclopedic knowledge, world knowledge. Social knowledge, we have very specific interpretations, very specific knowledge about social relations, hierarchies, uh, 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 behavioral practices, behavior patterns, and so on. Kinesthetic knowledge. We, we know so much about, about uh, pro mo movements, right, and, and, and also the behavior of medium-sized objects. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, what we mentioned today already, the embodiment, right? Our, our mind uh, does take into consideration the, 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 bodily, the bodily phenomena, the bodily uh, characteristic features of, of, of certain objects and of course the kinesthetics, the, the, the movement of procedural knowledge. We know that there are pro processes and procedures from A to B to B to C and so on. Uh, deictic knowledge, background knowledge, personal knowledge. Okay, there are, there are so many things, for example, in, a, in, in almost in any conversation, of course, I, I know who I am talking to and why, why we are exchanging uh, ideas, but I have to attribute so much mental content to my partner, uh, otherwise, otherwise it would be pretty empty, right? Empty conversation, for example. Tacit knowledge. Michael Polanyi, for example, had wonderful ideas about tacit knowledge, intuitive knowledge, of course, knowledge of frames, scenarios, uh, mental maps, cognitive models, and so on and, and so forth. Um, for example, if you say, uh, if, if you have this uh, utterance, right, not, not a sentence, an utterance, you make great coffee, right? You may, you know, you, you may... Uh, 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 make it more complicated, darling, you make great coffee, or sweetie, you make great coffee. But look at this. There could be a situation, situation, right? Not, not a context, but a situation uh, when there is a question. Do, I, do you think I make good coffee? Do I make good coffee? You make great coffee. So it's an appraisal. It's, it's really a very positive evaluation. Uh, do you think I'm a good cook? You make great coffee. That's different, right? Okay. Uh, I'm afraid it's your turn to make coffee. You make great coffee. Again, right, a completely different interpretation out of the situation, but the situation, of course, has to be represented in our, in our mind. Um, there are several examples. I will not go into that. I've got a flat tire. It's completely different if you pull up to a garage I've got a flat tire, please fix my flat tire. Or on the highway, if police come, you say, well, I, I've got a flat tire, this is why I'm here. Okay, uh, you, you're not offering the, the, the officer to fix, to fix the flat tire and, and so on and so forth. Uh, discourse, right, discourse is a narrative. Discourse is a complex of contexts that will be articulated in a stretch of verbal, verbal uh, articulation. So this course is, is about types of texts. And it, it's a matter of erudition, right? Erudite uh, education will, 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 will improve your skills, okay, to distinguish between different text types, style, 
registers, we know that's sociolinguistics. Cultural narratives, we have cultural narratives in people's minds, right? Ethnic, national, subculture, subgroups, okay, all, you know, different types of narratives exist, norms, cliches, memes, prejudices. Language and speech conversation is a medium for negotiating meanings, skills for social interaction. So social interaction then is, a, is an exercise, right? We exercise how to negotiate, how to approach another person, okay, what to assume, what, what, kind, of, what kind of intentions to attribute to another person. And also social cognition uh, uh, exists for meaning construction, individual and collective mental processes uh, along the lines of intentionality. That means we, we attribute uh, intentions, desires to other people. So natural language, and I'm coming to the end now. The natural language has several features. There exists an autonomous, formal, syntactic system generating well-formed linguistic expressions. Innate, if you like, we have language acquisition device, LAD, as part of the language faculty. So human beings are believed to have this very specific faculty, right? The language faculty that generates, of course, you, you acquire language and generates language. The lexicon is not a storage of listed lexical items, but a rich associative system of potentially meaningful elements in the mental lexicon. Our knowledge of language is embedded in a wide range of cognitive skills, some of which are general purpose skills, as I mentioned before, uh, reasoning, inferencing, these are general purpose skills, cognitive skills, and some are very specific like vision, hearing, and other types of, uh, for example, uh, language, uh, the, the, the syntax of language. Context creation, is a most ubiquitous and most efficient mental construction to which we match articulated meanings and intentions. A context is a frame of reference for meaning creation, which functions as a shared mental domain for the purposes of social cognition. I would like to conclude by saying that my analysis and arguments above have aimed at pointing to the increasing importance of secondary socialization. Secondary socia socialization might include workplace, social environment, intercult intercultural encounters, mobility to facilitate lifelong learning, and of course the World Wide Web. Our new era of diverse knowledge sources and communication techniques is a great, maybe unprecedented challenge to all of us in human communities. Reflective human cognition, enhanced with empathy, intentionality in the Husserlian sense, solidarity, social responsibility, and adaptability will pave the way to appropriate responses to radically new contexts of learning and socialization. However, the greatest challenge seems to be the changing epistemic and ontological status of mental contexts we create for mutual understanding. Conventional values for authority and authentic authentication of information sources are not decisive anymore. Instead of the Habermasian communicative consensus, like social effort put into that, individual validation choices will determine context building. Instead of conventional grounding, temporary consensus in the virtual world can create social reality. The perception of social reality is built on different ontologies. A relativization of contexts will be a guiding principle in the creation of social meanings. For example, online, and offline states of individuals. Right now, for example, as we are here, online or offline. Social cognition has to be built on new sensitivity as the ont ontological status of contexts are becoming more and more elusive. Thank you very much. <laughs>